Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Frederick de Boer. He is a writer and academic. He writes mostly on culture and politics, and today we're talking about his new book, How Elites Ate the Social Justice Movement. So, Freddie, welcome to the show. It's a big pleasure to have you on. Uh, thanks for having me. So I would like to start by asking you about the George Floyd incident, because that's a topic that you spend uh, quite a bit of time talking about in the book. Uh, but before we get into the incident itself and perhaps what it tells us about how activists dealt with it back then and what it tells us about activism more broadly, and in recent times, could you tell us a little bit perhaps about the political and cultural context in the US that immediately preceded it? Yeah, I spend a great deal of time in the book um, <clears throat> talking about the run up to the George Floyd uh, uh, murder, uh, because I think that it's important to understand sort of where we were coming from at that moment. So the United States uh, if we're going to go really big, broad terms, um, you know, I would sort of say that we had uh, a uh, uh, post-World uh, War II period that's defined by um, a sort of stultifying sort of social conservatism. It was a period of an extreme uh, sort of uh, growth in terms of America's military dominance, its diplomatic dominance, its economic dominance. And this was married, though, to a sort of social conservatism and a vision of sort of God and country, um, and intense patriotism in very prescribed social roles. Uh, men were the breadwinners who went off and did jobs. Women were meant to stay at home and to uh, raise children. Um, <clears throat> and you had systematic exclusion of black people from uh, many of the sort of elite professions in American life and from uh, uh, sort of professional opportunity and political opportunity. And you have the 1960s, which is an era of American life that has been mythologized and, and analyzed to, to death for a very long time, which is largely seen as, and uh, correctly, as a period of great sort of social prog uh, progress in terms of dramatically expanding opportunity for women, uh, uh, dramatically uh, <clears throat> uh, challenging uh, formal segregation in the United States, uh, uh, dismantling the Jim Crow laws. Um, in the 1970s, by the middle of the 1970s, you have an American radicalism, which has run out of steam. Um, there had been a sort of collapse in the uh, uh, intensity of public protest that had been such a part of the late uh, 60s and early 70s. Um, there was profound disagreement within uh, what was had been the civil rights movement about what the next stage was uh, following the Voting Rights Act uh, and the Civil Rights Act in the mid-1960s. Um, the civil rights movement was widely regarded to have run out of steam, in part because there wasn't a clear uh, goal for them. And uh, <clears throat> that had led to the Black Power Movement, um, and you had many sort of vestiges of extreme sort of radical sentiment in the country, such as with the Weather Underground, which was a domestic terrorist organization. Uh, the second wave of feminism had become quite militant, but we weren't able to generate anything out of this. There really wasn't much in the way of meaningful change that was happening. And then we had a period of what's called stagflation, which uh, was a stagnant economy that was not growing, even though we had sky high inflation, which created really terrible economic conditions and it contributed to a backlash. Uh, and that backlash resulted in the administration of Ronald Reagan. Uh, the 1980s are defined by Reaganite conservatism. Um, <clears throat> Reagan uh, returns to a message of national greatness, of unapologetic patriotism, of unapologetic Christianity in American life. Uh, he uh, dramatically curtails union rights. Uh, the union uh, uh, unionized rate in the country uh, collapses. Um, and you, you know, he says it's mourning in America. This is meaning it's mourning in America for a certain conservative sort of uh, <clears throat> vision. 1990s, um, while it's a dominated by a uh, democratic uh, administration, um, in many ways is a continuation of basic Reaganite principles. So Bill Clinton is a Democrat, but he runs explicitly on the message, the era of big government is over. Some of his major accomplishments include slashing the American welfare state, uh, signing a law that uh, criminalizes gay marriage, 
uh, <clears throat> beginning the process of dramatically expanding sort of the federal prison system and who's uh, who's falling into it, intensifying the drug war. So it's a continuation of a sort of uh, <clears throat> conservatism at the level of policy. We're at the sort of social level, the country continued to sort of push forward and gay rights become something that goes from being truly a niche thing to being a, a popular thing. 2001, we have a president who had come into power under extremely contentious circumstances because he lost the popular vote and there was everything in Florida. Um, <clears throat> and then 9-11 happens. And 9-11 um, <clears throat> results in a period of extremely intense mandatory patriotism, mandatory mil militarism, uh, it uh, sees overnight the creation of an, a massive digital surveillance system of the American people. We invade uh, Afghanistan. We have invade Iraq. Um, <clears throat> the George W. Bush uh, administration, though, proves to be so remarkably inept and to have caused so much uh, terrible situations that uh, it uh, empowers Barack Obama, who is elected in 2008. Obama is someone who is fairly new to politics. He's served only a single a partial term as a U.S. senator, um, <clears throat> which was useful for him because he was not in the Senate yet when uh, the vote came up for voting for the Iraq war authorization, which would prove to be very politically useful for him. Uh, Hillary Clinton, his primary opponent, had voted in favor of the Iraq war, which became a huge issue for her in the, in the Democratic primary. Obama runs on a, a concept of hope and change. He's telling everyone, I'm the transformational candidate. He does get some good things done in office, including a, you know, <clears throat> deeply flawed, but an improvement on the status quo uh, omnibus health care legislation passed. But overall, Obama in, er, reveals himself to not be a radical or a revolutionary, but to be an incrementalist, to be someone who's very deeply married to working within institutions, who is constantly telling people not to go too fast and that we need to slow down. Famously, he doesn't f officially come out as a supporter of gay marriage, I think until 2014, uh, I think, a year before it becomes legal everywhere. Um, <clears throat> The degree to which it was fair to sort of assume that Obama would be a sort of radical president is a debate that people have had for many years and can continue to have. But one way or the other, Obama was not that. Um, so in 2016, <clears throat> the Obama's uh, long period of normal, many people felt that he had sort of restored a period of normalcy. Um, <clears throat> now it was time for, for his successor, who was again Hillary Clinton, to ascend into the office and continue the period of normalcy. But unfortunately for Hillary Clinton, below the surface, there was deep discontent in the country. Uh, in 2008, 2009, we had had a terrible financial crisis. The financial crisis had sparked a long uh, <clears throat> a period of recession, which had left the labor markets slack for years. Uh, the, the response from the Federal uh, uh, Reserve and from the government, um, uh, fiscal policy, monetary policy were insufficient to actually sort of restart the uh, economy the way that it should have been. Again, Obama is an incrementalist and doesn't want to rock the boat. Uh, and so you have this underlying tension of just many, many people in the country who either don't have jobs or whose wages have been depressed by this long period of slack labor, labor market. The Occupy Wall Street moment in 2011 didn't come too much in and of itself, but it demonstrated that among young people, there was this, a fierce hunger for a left of Obama alternative, and which resulted in the Bernie Sanders primary campaign in 2016. Uh, Sanders loses. Uh, he does lose legitimately. So some Sanders fans continue to say that the primary was stolen from him. There's no evidence that that was true. It is true that the institutions of the Democratic Party were rooting against him, but ultimately Hillary Clinton won. Unfortunately, Hillary Clinton was an immensely unpopular politician, and she was presiding over this period where the Democrats were saying, hey, let's keep the normal going, right? We have this long period of normal. Let's just keep normal going. But for many, many Americans, particularly in places like Michigan and Wisconsin, which she lost, normal was not working. And now we have Donald Trump. Donald Trump is a, well, he's Donald Trump. Uh, he is, scandal just sort of flows out of his body. Uh, he is serially offensive. Sometimes he seems to give offense as a strategy, sometimes just because he's unstable. I mean, he appears genuinely to be an unstable person. Uh, and then we have the COVID-19 pandemic, which sets everybody on edge.
So in, in, in everybody's stuck inside with nothing to do but to think about the state of the world. So at, at 2020, you have this scenario where um, a period of a sort of brief period of radicalism in the 1960s and early 1970s had given way to a long period of sort of <clears throat> the Reaganite revolution remaking the country in many ways. Uh, and then following that, you had a series of Democratic presidents or Democratic candidates who did not really appear to be much in the way of alternatives. There was a hunger for something that was really different. Unfortunately, many people took the very different thing in the form of Donald Trump, but people also were, were demanding left-wing radical change. Um, and one of the things that is the most, one of the most obvious forms of sort of things that people think need radical change is the status of black people in, in the United States. George Floyd's uh, murder was horrific. Uh, <clears throat> it was also ca caught on camera. Had George Floyd been killed 10 years previous, it's likely that no one records his murder and it might have become like a local story of some notoriety. It would never have, have sort of what happened, it would never have happened. So the country gets lit on fire. And it's, it's yes, it was about George Floyd. Yes, it was about Black Lives Matter and the status of black people. But it's also was a, a reflection of a feeling that um, <clears throat> there has been no genuine left wing alternatives in American life for a half a century, really. And uh, <clears throat> the, the institution of the Democratic Party is fundamentally conservative in many ways. And people were letting out their anger to say, we need real change. And so the George Floyd murder happens and then what about how people reacted to it and how activists namely organized and organized their protests uh, around it? I mean, how do you look at it? Do you think that uh, the intentions there were good and what were the result? Uh, I mean, what were the main goals of the activists and how do you look at the results they got, basically? Yeah, so I think one of the major problems that left-wing activists and thinkers, et cetera, have um, in the uh, <clears throat> in sort of American tradition, but especially in the last quarter century, maybe, is that there's this obsession with seeing connections between different problems, which in one hand is, you know, usually descriptively true that there are connections between these problems. But it makes every issue the everything issue. So I, I think I might mention this in the book, but um, when I was doing anti-Iraq war activism in the uh, early and mid 2000s, um, every march, every protest, every event would, the list of demands would just balloon over time. So we'd say all troops out of Afghanistan and in Iraq. Okay, fine. Uh, also, we need to close the secret torture prisons like Guantanamo Bay. Okay, yeah, I can see how that's connected. Also, we need to end Israeli occupation of Palestine. Okay, like, I, 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 I do see how they're connected, but, you know, we're, we're really broadening here. And then by the end of it, it's like, oh, also no sweatshop labor, right? In other words, like, everything always becomes an everything sort of problem. I think that's something that really happened in 2020, which is that you have this sort of specific issue of police violence against black people. You then have broader questions about uh, black people's status in the United States, uh, and in particular, their various economic problems relative to the median. Um, but then you just, you always get this kitchen sink sort of thing where everyone is sort of throwing in their two cents and it just grows and it grows and it grows. And so, you know, this goes sort of in, in two, two directions at once so that like you had people saying, well, you know, if you think about it this way, this is a reproductive rights issue, right? And I, I read those arguments and you say, really? <laughs> like a, a, a black guy getting choked to death in the street by a white cop is a reproductive rights issue. But then they have their essay and they lay out the case and it's like, okay, okay, I guess so. But then it goes the other way where, um, you know, uh, uh, Planned Parenthood put out a defund the police statement, right? You say, that seems to be pretty far from your purview, right? But then they say, well, if you think about it, like we're a justice oriented organization. And if we want to have justice anywhere, we have to have. And so one of the things that happens is that it becomes impossible to define 
what's the, the really specific issue right now? What do we want, right? Like, like what, what is it that we really need to change? And no one wants to be the one to say, okay, but, you know, Palestine really is a separate issue from Black Lives Matter, okay? Mm -hmm. Abortion rights really is a separate matter from Black Lives Matter, right? Like, that there's no, there's, no one wants to be the one setting those boundaries. But when you don't set the boundaries, it becomes impossible to sort of be focused. Why did defund the police become the demand? Why, why did that sort of suck up all the attention? I'm convinced that part of the reason why that became the demand associated with 2020 um, is because you had all these people who were just general radicals and lefties, people who I agree with on almost everything, um, <clears throat> and defund the police is like a, a radical restructuring of society. So, oh, we'll, we'll attack this problem and we'll do it in a way that, by the way, gives me things that I want anyway, right? But, but the problem with that is that, you know, you've now created a demand that you know you can't achieve and everything becomes directionless. Right. But do you think that here, I mean, perhaps we can focus on the Black Lives, uh, Black Lives Matter movement because that's the one that's mostly associated with the uh, aftermath of the George Floyd incident here. But I, I don't know if perhaps some of your criticisms would also apply more broadly to some of uh, leftist activism currently in the US, you'll tell me about that, but uh, is your issue mainly with the way they approach activism or perhaps also with some of the uh, empirical claims they make or perhaps some of the values they express? What's exactly the issue there? Sure. So, um, <clears throat> do black people and black men in particular face an unusual level of burden of violence from the police? We know that, that the answer to that is yes, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, it's not just true in terms of population, uh, it's also true uh, if you look at the number of interactions with the police. So yeah. there's been pretty good research on this front. Black people have more interactions with the police than white or Asian or Hispanic. Uh, many people would say that that in and of itself is a vestige of racism, but either way, um, even when controlling for the fact that they are interacting with the police at a higher rate, uh, they are, uh, those interactions end in violence more often. Now, I think a lot of people speak in uh, sort of elevated rhetorical terms that can exaggerate the risk of uh, being killed uh, by the police for an average b black person. Um, <clears throat> You know, even to be generous, right, like in terms of how we define a police killing or, or whose numbers we're looking at, in an average year, um, <clears throat> there's something like a, a, a few hundred uh, black people killed by the police. Obviously, that's too many. Uh, any for any race is too many. But there are, you know, 13% 13, 13 of the population uh, is, is black. Something like 44 million people in this country are black. So the the numerical sort of risk of dying in any given interaction for a black person is very very small um i agree with activists who say that that's not the point that you know the point is there are these obvious racial disparities in terms of police violence and we need to, to solve them um i also think that the bigger point is the killings are e the easiest thing to count they are the things that are most likely to set, end up in the stats Mm -hmm. Whereas any random act of police violence, someone just roughing up a black person, there's a very good chance we'll never end up in the stats anywhere. So that we sort of treat the, the killings themselves as sort of an indicator of the broader sort of thing. The approach of Black Lives Matter. Well, look, um, I think that it, to sort of connect back to something that I just said to you, um, they suffer from the same problem that the civil rights movement and the black power movement suffered from after 1965 or so, 1965, 66, which is um, a lack of a very clear, tangible policy demand. Uh, it took the civil rights movement a long time to get going, um, but once they got going, uh, they had the advantage that, okay, we need, first of all, the Voting Rights Act, right? Because the only way that we'll ever get uh, the power to change anything else in this country is if we make sure that 
the ability of black people to vote is not obstructed by the local sheriff or, who, or whoever. So the, the Voting Rights Act, Right Rights Act made uh, obstructing obstruct, the right of black people to vote a federal crime, uh, which gave it teeth. Whereas before, state laws said that it was illegal, but those state laws were, you know, meant to be enforced by police departments that were quite racist, right? And then they had the Civil Rights Act, right, like ending a whole bunch of things like discrimination in uh, uh, overt discrimination in housing, uh, discrimination uh, in terms of uh, you can't eat at our lunch counter if you're black, etc. Um, the discrimination uh, that had been built up in all sorts of different parts of discrimination of, dis of segregation, uh, which had sort of meant to be uh, dismantled by Brown versus Board of Ed on, in the public education side, for example, but had not been dismantled in many places. Um, once you get past those bills, then you have a, a, a um, like a dilemma of what do we do next? Um, <clears throat> Defund the police was uh, a demand uh, that people uh, sort of uh, brought out in 2020. Uh, reparations has been a place that many people have sort of put their energy and their moral force uh, since these times. But it is not really a coincidence, right, that um, uh, sort of black power politics, anti-racist politics, civil rights politics, whatever you want to call it, um, there's been a real slowdown since the middle of the 1960s, largely associated with not having a specific thing to ask for. And I think that that has afflicted Black Lives Matter. And then the other thing is, um, and I want to be clear about this, um, the job of a activist, including a Black Lives Matter activist, is not to be like, perfectly strategic all the time and just do exactly what, you know, is the most sort of like Obama approved incrementalist, here's what we do now sort of thing. Like a, a, an activist's job is to say what they believe to be true and to try to fight for a better world, right? Uh, and I'm not trying to tell them that they should be anything other than what they are. It is the case, right, as is true in any activist movement, that the average Black Lives Matter activist is very different from the average Black American. Right. Um, and again, that's true of anybody. Right. Like um, uh, the average feminist activist is not like the average American woman. Um, and that's OK. But you have in Black Lives Matter um, dominantly young. So people, let's say, like generally like 35 and younger, um, extremely well educated in general and especially compared to uh the black population overall so um a huge percentage of the uh most prominent most active most engaged black lives matter activists have college degrees uh in the country less than 40 percent have college degrees the uh, rate for black people is even lower so in that way they're different um they're also very far left right the average black lives matter person is someone who is not just uh, politically radical in terms of their uh, approach to um, <clears throat> uh, racial politics, but is also someone who, you know, tends to favor things like, um, <clears throat> uh, well, like defunding the police, but also um, really robust uh, <clears throat> expansions of uh, the uh, federal expenditure for like the welfare state, the social safety net. Many of them are explicit critics of capitalism and reject capitalism, um, that many of them <clears throat> will, you know, glom onto ideas like the abolition of the family, et cetera, et cetera, because they're activists, right? Mm -hmm. And they have left activist politics. But that's simply not what the average black American is like. The average black Democrat, um, it's important to say, is well to the right of the average white liberal, okay? So there is a tendency in our media uh, and in our politics to treat black people as just like this unified radical block. But that's never really been true. If you actually look at voting behavior and polling, et cetera, going back to the formation of the modern democratic coalition. So the sort of the LBJ coalition, the, uh, <clears throat> we, we lose the Southern Democrats, the those states all turn red because of uh, civil rights legislation. Uh, and so now you have Coastal America, 
uh, <clears throat> you have the map that we all know now, and you have racial minorities, you have unionized workers, you, you begin to have over time that you gather support from uh, college educated voters. Um, throughout that period, um, uh, black voters, black Democrats have been uh, a, a conservative force within the party. Um, and this is something that I find like actively offends some people when I say it, but it's just true, right? Like it's just a reflection of their actual behavior in the voting booth uh, and in polling. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of black people have um, generally sort of economically progressive Democrat views on things like this, how big the welfare state should be, the, should the government help to guarantee medical insurance for everyone, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, should, should, how, how generous should Social Security and Medicare be, et cetera. Um, but they often tend to be more conservative on social issues, um, which is in part a, a reflection of the fact that um, black Americans are the uh, most actively religious uh, racial category within the country, uh, and many of them come from more, not conservative, but like traditionalist social uh, <clears throat> backgrounds. And so, for example, it's an objective fact, and again, this is something that bothers people when I say it, but it's an objective fact that um, it took Black Democrats longer to get on board with gay marriage than it did other groups. And so what you end up having is you have an activist class that is just not like the people that they ostensibly speak for. Um, and so, if, for example, in the Black Lives Matter polling, even immediately after the death of George Floyd, um, large majorities of black respondents rejected the idea that we should defund the police. And very often they were asking for more presence, a police presence in their communities. And so what you have is you have a media class and a political class and an academia class that are saying, oh, black people wanted to fund the police. but they are not paying attention to the fact that those activists just are not the same as the median black American. And is this activist class uh, what uh, you call uh, the elites in the book? I mean, are these the elites that ate or took over the social justice movement in the U.S.? Yeah, so if I was going to define it broadly, what do I mean by elites in the book's title? Mm -hmm. I'm talking about, um, <clears throat> like, yes, I think the people who are like the activists within Black Lives Matter are a part of this broader phenomenon, which is you have this class of people or this caste of people uh, who are, um, <clears throat> number one, uh, extremely highly educated. So you have uh, a, a class of people that is uh, almost universally has uh, college educations. Mm -hmm. They, uh, <clears throat> if you look at uh, academia, media, the nonprofits, government workers, um, they have uh, uh, truly disproportionate rates of attending elite colleges, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, <clears throat> a lot of people don't, don't seem to understand this, but the average uh, American high school student who goes to college never even applies to a school that rejects more students than it accepts, right? Like even applying to exclusive uh, colleges is rare. Um, <clears throat> these people um, almost all have degrees from those schools. Many of them have master's degrees or other professional degrees, graduate degrees. Uh, <clears throat> they are extremely far left, uh, both economically and socially, but especially socially. Uh, they tend to be uh, <clears throat> socially oriented in their politics because another thing about them is uh, be related to their level of education, they tend to come from considerable uh, means in their families. They may not have been born rich, but their parents are at least middle class uh, and very often are quite affluent. So they've never really experienced material deprivation Right. They don't really know what it's like to not be able to pay the rent. They don't really know what it's like to be you know, terribly burdened by debt. Uh, and so their orientation tends to be very strongly towards social issues, uh, cultural issues, issues of, uh, <clears throat> of race that are not economic in, in nature, but that are, tend to be more cultural, uh, issues of gender and sexuality that are more cultural rather than more economic. They like messaging. It's all about um, uh, sort of like uh, 
confronting sort of social relations as the basic interaction between human beings. And they, are, they tend to be um, meritocrats. So they are people who are very sort of on the face of it, they're very critical of meritocracy. And they'll often tell you that meritocracy is uh, a sham or it's racist or whatever. But they themselves have worked incredibly hard within the meritocracy to get ahead, right? They busted their ass in high school to get into a really good college. In college, they worked very, very hard in order to be the most sort of outstanding candidate for jobs that they possibly could be. Uh, and then they get into elite institutions, um, nonprofits being sort of like the, the, the most obvious example of what I'm talking about, but also media and academia and government. Uh, and, they, and they climb the ladder, right? So mm -hmm. in many, many ways, these people are clearly different from the populations that they are purporting to speak for. Um, and they have a, a background and a sort of set of uh, intrinsic attitudes about what's valuable. That's at, in conflict with average people. Um, but they've reached essentially like hegemonic status within many American institutions, right? If, if you go to like the, the major nonprofits that have such influence on our government, um, if you throw a rock, you will hit someone with a degree from the University of Chicago or Yale or Stanford, right? And, th and that, has, that has consequences for policy. And so let's get into some of those consequences. So if the social justice movement is dominated or at least headed by people who have, as you described there, this sort of disconnect from the typical uh, American citizen, from the groups they represent. Uh, what are the consequences in terms of how they approach activism, the results they get, perhaps the policies they want, and the consequences for actually the American people more broadly? Okay, so let's, let's look at like <clears throat> um, uh, the child tax credit expansion. Okay. So, mm -hmm. um, for those who don't know, uh, the United States has a, a child tax credit, which is a, uh, <clears throat> a subsidy that, that our, our country sort of gives to parents. But in its, in its sort of current legally mandated form, it's quite measly uh, and it also doesn't result in cash benefits for people. Um, so it really is just, just for almost everyone functions as an actual tax credit. And a lot of Americans um, <clears throat> make a lot of American parents make such little money that their federal tax burden is already effectively zero. Um, in 2020, as part of um, some of these COVID re relief bills, or, or 2021, um, <clears throat> there was a brief uh, passage of an expansion of the child tax credit. And this expansion resulted in cash money going into the hands of millions of parents. Um, again, this was sort of uh, possible because of the emergency conditions that COVID had created. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe Manchin, uh, who is effectively like the God Emperor of the uh, US Senate, because he is the sort of 50th vote for the Democrats. Mm -hmm. Joe Manchin, uh, uh, after one year of the, this expanded tax credit, uh, refused to support um, COVID uh, omnibus legislation that included the continued expansion of this thing. Um, the uh, child tax credit is a really perfect example of the kind of policy that Democrats should be pursuing because it is universal in that any poor parent can benefit from it of any race. And so you don't have the complicated politics of race uh, specific programs. Uh, but it, it also disproportionately helps black parents and black children because of the realities of poverty in the United States. And so you get the benefit of what is essentially uh, a sort of weighted program for uh, black and Hispanic people with also including anyone who's white and, his, and or Asian who needs it and without the sort of political headache of we're going to pass a program specifically for black people, especially true in an era uh, with the Supreme Court is, uh, <clears throat> well, is what it is. Um, there are people who, who have compellingly argued that if we were allowed to make that program permanent, that it would cut black poverty by a third. 
and not just black child poverty, but black poverty. Right? Mm -hmm. um, it came and went, and there was barely a ripple of interest. There was barely a ripple in our media of discussion. Like policy wonk people talked about it, but it wasn't front page news for almost anyone. Um, now compare that to affirmative action. Affirmative action had another big court case uh, a few months ago. Uh, the, you know, depending on who you ask, the colleges are just gonna be able to do it by another means or it was effectively ended, but they, the, the, the Supreme Court justice this is attempted to end race-based affirmative action in American colleges and universities. Um, the only people who this really applies to is the most upwardly mobile and el academically elite slice of black teenagers, right? So like you have this very narrow age band of people who are applying to college, but it's not just black kids who are applying to college in general. Again, remember, um, most American students take just about any, uh, excuse me, most American colleges take just about any student who applies, right? Like. Mm -hmm. There, it is not the case for anyone that there is just nowhere that they can go to college because they're not good enough to get in. If you can cut a tuition check uh, or sign a promissory note for student loans, you can go to college somewhere. So the people who are helped by affirmative action uh, at these elite schools uh, are black students who are good enough to be sort of in the conversation, uh, excuse me, uh, for uh, for to, to get into Yale or Harvard or wherever, but they're not so good that they would have gotten in anyway, right? Because there's plenty of black students who get in uh, <clears throat> without uh, affirmative action anyway. So there's a, I mean, there's a whole phenomenon of uh, elite black students who refuse to mark their race because they don't want to be perceived as having gotten an advantage. Um, if you just look at like numerically, that's just a tiny, tiny slice of humanity, right? Mm -hmm. Like that is just a, it, the, the people who it's relevant to is just so small. And the effect of it in like anti-racist terms is kind of hard to define anyway. But we had a mountain of commentary about this decision, right? It dominated political discussion for weeks, right? And so this is what I'm talking about when I talk about how our sort of the elite nature of who our punting class is influences uh, policy, which is, um, the child tax credit should be on the lips of every progressive person. It should be one of our absolute top priorities. Affirmative action, okay, like I, I agree with like, I think with the uh, concept of race-based affirmative action, but it is just not relevant to even uh, the vast majority of black people or Hispanic people. And so why does that happen? Well, it happens because our media class is made up of people who went to elite universities, who have always been elite students, who have experiences that are just totally different from that of the American uh, average American. Same thing with the people in our nonprofits, same thing with the people in academia. And so that's exactly the kind of consequence I'm talking about here, is the priority of certain issues over another is totally uh, reflected by uh, who our sort of priest class is uh, among lefty people. Uh, but on that point regarding affirmative action, just for it to be clear, then uh, you don't necessarily disagree in principle with race-based or uh, sex-based or whatever kind of based uh, affirmative action. It's mostly perhaps in the context of specifically American colleges, universities, and other places that, uh, I mean, that's the way it gets applied. Right. Yeah, I mean, look, um, I support the idea of race-based affirmative action for black students as a, a form of reparations for slavery and mm -hmm. to try to counteract traditional uh, discrimination. Okay. Unfortunately, a long time ago, the Supreme Court made that kind of affirmative action illegal. And they said it has to be done for diversity purposes, which is mm -hmm. a whole other thing. Okay. Um, but the other thing is like, look, like uh, <clears throat> in principle means like in an ideal scenario, I support it. In mm -hmm. reality, elite colleges just use those affirmative action slots to harvest the richest students that they can who can check black or Hispanic. Okay, okay. so like the, the, the like the classic black 
affirmative action student at an Ivy League university, right, um, is not a poor black kid coming from uh, the tough neighborhoods on the south side of Chicago, right? Mm -hmm. It's not a poor black kid who grew up uh, in deep poverty. The classic mm -hmm. Ivy League affirmative action slot recipient um, is like the son of a uh, cardiovascular surgeon who emigrated from Ghana 20 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. So um, these schools want to uh, <clears throat> get alumni donations. They wanna make sure that the alumni donation money keeps flowing. The easiest way to do that is by having people whose parents are already rich. Uh, and so <clears throat> there's this, you know, it's a longstanding sort of stereotype in these schools that like the kids who get the affirmative action slots are, you know, kids whose parents are like sort of wealthy black professionals from Africa or from the Caribbean who come here as immigrants, which is just not what we started affirmative action for. Like that, that just wasn't the purpose of it. Um, there's a group of Harvard uh, professors and Harvard alumni who have for years and years been trying to force Harvard to open its books and show sort of who it's letting in with these slots. And Harvard has always said no. And the reason they say no is because they know what they're doing is not the actual intention of affirmative action. Mm -hmm. But since we've been talking here so much about race and, for example, race-based affirmative action, what do you think about the idea also because it applies to activism nowadays of intersectionality? Yeah, I don't know what intersectionality means. Um, I, I've read it, uh, you know, I've been reading it for 20 years. Um, <clears throat> when you ask people to define intersectionality, right, mm -hmm. um, it's the idea that different like oppressions, like oppression of women and oppression of black people can intersect, can sort of come together and create like different levels of or more intensity of or more complexity mm -hmm. in oppression and it's just like okay like that's just, that's just not like a interesting or compelling idea like everybody knows that i think like um the people who don't excuse me um who aren't inclined to see the hand of racism or sexism in anything are never going to accept that there's an intersectional problem in the first place and the people who are, li are liable to say yes, racism is at work here, or yes, sexism is at work here, they already think that there's connections between them, right? Like, I didn't take uh, Kimberly Crenshaw or whoever to invent the idea of intersectionality. Like, it's just plain-facedly true. So what intersectionality actually ends up being in debate is, like, this sort of free-flowing signifier that has no specific meaning and that people can just sort of bend to mean whatever they want. It's just, it's... Um, it's just like a, it's like a cudgel, right? Like you're in an argument, you're losing the argument, you don't know what to say, you just reach out and grab the word intersectionality and you throw it around. Right, but then, I mean, it's not that you completely disagree with uh, people with some of the claims that people that come from the, let's call it intersectionality movement, uh, some of their claims, but uh, perhaps that they are, uh, I don't know, just banal claims yeah. to some extent. Yeah, I mean, look, like, if I wanted to, like, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the concept of, like, steel manning, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. yeah, so, like, pre presenting, like, the best, strongest opinion possible position. Yes. What I would say is um, the problem with so much of these pop academic terms that turn up in lefty politics is... Um, they are based on simplistic sort of mimetic sort of use. So in other words, you have people who go to get their PhDs or whatever um, in women's studies at Dartmouth or wherever, and um, they go on Tumblr and they talk about the, these concepts that, that they've learned, and they're actually informed and they're actually speaking with a particular degree of specificity, right? Mm -hmm. um, somebody else sees it on Tumblr and they just absorb the concept there and they learn, oh, intersectionality is a word that has power. I'm going to use this word because it has power. And they take it to Twitter and other people see it on Twitter. And now, whereas at least on the Tumblr, you might have had 2000 words on this subject. Now you've got uh, 140 characters worth 
of what intersectionality is. But again, like what definitely gets transmitted is the, the fact that, the notion that intersectionality is a word that has power, right? And so inevitably it just gets used in this completely meaningless sense, right? Um, and it's not, look, it's not just like, um, this is not just a problem of intersectionality or social justice politics or cultural studies or whatever you want to say. Like, you know, I'm a Marxist and I can say that like 90% of the time I use, I see the word um, dialectic, di dialectics out there. I don't have the slightest idea what they're talking about. Right. And I'm a, I'm a pretty informed Marxist. Right. And I don't know what you mean when you say dialectics. It sounds like you you learned it on Twitter. Right. So I'm sure that there's a like more responsible, more meaningful version of these arguments, but like the way that it actually exists as a social phenomenon, intersectionality just means that like, if you're black and a woman, then you have like complicated forms of, of oppression that come from both and like, yeah, but, but so what, like, of course you do. Mm -hmm. And I would like to ask you, since we're talking about American politics, what do you think about the use of uh, of the term woke and perhaps what some of the anti-woke people say? Because, uh, I mean, as far as I understand it, um, woke, if it means anything significant, it, it refers to a tiny, tiny minority of people on the left in the US. And many times anti-woke people use the term in an exaggerated manner to make exaggerated claims. And perhaps one good example of that would be what is going on in Florida with the Santis and all of that. And then it leads to a huge backlash against, uh, let's say, legitimate social justice uh, uh, social justice stuff that people do. I mean. Uh, and then, uh, I mean, basically it reinforces some of the positions on the right. So, I mean, what do you think about it, basically? Sure. So the, the word woke appears only three times in 250 pages of my book. Yeah. And all three times it's expressed as sort of saying like, like not me using the term woke, uh, but sort of like saying, oh, conservative anti-woke or whatever. In other words, okay. I'm, I'm using it to refer to how is it is used in in these debates. Mm -hmm. um, I, sure. I don't like to use it without qualification mm -hmm. because it is um, like you say, it's just it's, it's just used so pejoratively yeah. that like and it's so broadly by people on the right that it has no meaning yeah. um, in the way that they say it. I do think that like it's not true to say that woke has literally no meaning ever, right? In other words, mm -hmm. if I said to you that guy's woke, you would not say, "Oh, he's a political conservative," right? Mm -hmm. No, you'd, you'd say, "Well, he's somewhat on the left," right? So mm -hmm. it, it at least has that much meaning. But also, if I said that guy's woke, you wouldn't think, "Oh, he's he's like an old school Marxist, a real class first guy." You say, "Oh no, like mm -hmm. woke means like sort of identity politics." So like. Once you do that, once you were able to sort of say like, okay, it, it, it means some, not this and not this, it at least yeah. has some meaning. Yeah. I think the problem is that people who embrace what I call social justice politics um, are really deeply resistant to naming their political tendency. Um, I think that they often want to represent their politics as being just like, oh, just like correct politics or just not racist, not sexist, not sexist politics. But of course, like the claims of this, of the social justice movement um, are sort of specific and they have content and they are subject to review and subject to rejection and sometimes subject to ridicule, right? Like that's, sorry, like everybody's sub politics are subject to ridicule in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and so perhaps this will be my last question. Do you have any solutions to some of the problems with um, activism on the left in America in the current day that we talked about? I mean, you know, the, the, the fundamental question will always be for left activists. Um, what relationship should we have towards the Democratic Party? Uh, it is a question that um, consumes everything else that happens. 
Uh, there is a lot of stuff that goes on that is sort of outside the auspices of the Democratic Party. Yeah. Some of it has real meaning. Um, <clears throat> the right does not have this same sort of existential crisis about its relationship to the Republican Party for the simple reason that, like, the far right gets what it wants out of the out of the Republican Party, at least in terms of like the specific goals of the Republicans. Okay, so in other words, the 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 Republicans might not do everything that the far right wants. They might not accomplish it, but there is no question that the Republicans serve the interests of the far right, define their project according to the interests of the far right, uh, work hard to make the far right feel like they are the center of the party and always sort of tug the party farther and farther to the right, right? Like the, the way that the Republican Party operates, it is fealty to conservatives, a rejection of trying to push towards the middle, and a dedication to moving farther and farther right. The Democratic Party does not function in the opposite direction. The Democratic Party tends to chase the center. It tends to want to rein in the far left. It often repudiates the far left and sort of defines itself against the far left. Um, and what that results in is that, you know, a conservative activist has no reason to have a crisis of conscience about whether to embrace the Republican Party or not, because the party is trying to pull as far right as it can. Um, I think that uh, our, our activist class would be well served, um, first of all, um, to become more issue oriented, right, to be more specific about what specific things that it wants, to stop making it everything into an everything organization, right? To say, hey, we're, we're Planned Parenthood and we're staffed by people who want to defund the police and our donors are people who want to defund the police, but we are going to have the uh, <clears throat> like mission oriented status of saying we are re a reproductive health organization that fights for abortion rights and that's all we're gonna do. And that's true of those giant national organizations, but also of all kinds of small local ones. Um, and yeah, just find specific material ways that you can make your community better and drag things to the left. To the degree that it's useful to you, form relationships with local politicians, and they are almost always going to be Democrats, right? Um, in scenarios where you can primary someone in a Democratic primary, do it. If you are in a local race where a third party uh, candidate has a real chance of winning, run a third party candidate. Um, but you have to have the attitude towards the Democratic Party that it is neither everything nor nothing, right? That you can't just become a wing of the Democratic Party or else there's no point. But also, if you never do anything that influences the Democratic Party, you'll never have any power. And how about, uh, and this will be my last question, how about giving a voice to the least privileged people? Because as you talked about there at a certain point, um, I mean, the, when we talked about the elites, you named people who are educated, usually upper class. So, uh, I mean, wouldn't it also be important perhaps to pay more attention or to give more space to people who are of uh, less privilege, let's say, in, in activism? So I, I would not put it that way for the simple okay. reason that, that those, those act, those are the members of the elite case, right? Um, okay. They have a real talent for divine, defining themselves as the sort of most oppressed okay. in the face of all evidence, right? Like mm -hmm. they'll, they'll always find a way to say, I'm the, the most oppressed in the room, so I get to speak. No, I think that uh, we should um, encourage everyone to speak. We should say we all have something to contribute. We all have needs. Uh, we're not going to privilege anyone's voices here. We're necessarily going to worry about the issues and the interests of the people who are suffering the most because we're a justice movement and we want to fix these things. But what we want to do is create organizations where everyone feels valued and heard so that we don't have to like have this artificial process of, oh, you're the most oppressed person, so you speak next. And instead, we just have an open forum where everybody feels equally valid and that problem will take care of itself. Okay, great. So the book is again, How Elites Ate the Social Justice Movement. I'm leaving a link to it in the description box of this interview. Uh, apart from the book, you would you like to tell people where they can find you on the internet? Yeah, you can check me out at freddydebore.substack.com. I run a, a newsletter, uh, multiple posts every week. You should check it out. 
Great. Also leaving a link to it in the description box of this interview. And Freddy, thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show. It's been fun to talk to you. Thanks for having me, Ricardo. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for watching the interview until the end. Please share it, leave a like, comment and hit the subscription button. And if you like what I'm doing and to keep the channel sustainable, please consider supporting it on Patreon or PayPal. Even just $1 per month is already a great help. This show is brought to you by Enlights Learning and Development Done Differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Perga Larson, Jerry Mueller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernardo Seixas, Olaf Alex, Adam Castle, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassio, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Kavanagh, Michael Stormir, Samuel Andreev, Francis Ford, Tiago Nunes, Fergal Cusson, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Jonathan Leibrandt, John Linhar, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Weira, Tom Hamel, Sardas France, David Sloan Wilson, Yassila Des Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nalek Back, Guy Madison, Gary G. Alman, Saima Fazal, Adrian Yegi, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pans Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Loaki, George Stéphanus, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Moray, Alex Shaw, Amari Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheists, Larry D. Lee Jr., Old Erringbun, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassi, Zigor N., Jeff McMahon, Jake Zuel, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Thomas Dobner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Kimberly Johnson, Benjamin Galbert, Jessica Nowicki, Linda Brandin, Nicholas Carlson, Ismael Benzliman, George Coriatis, Valentin Steinman, Per Crowley's, Kate Von Goller, Alexander Hubbard, Liam Dunaway, B.R., Masood Ali Mohammadi, and Perpendicular, a special thanks to my producers, is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Thomas Vanek, Tom Vanegden, Bernard Hugni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John Carlo Montenegro, Al Nick Ortiz and Nick Golden, and to my executive producers, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano, Bogdan Canivets, and Vega G. Thank you for all.